If you're watching this, then you've probably used a keyboard of some form in the last several minutes. These typing interfaces give us control over much of our daily lives, but have you ever stopped and wondered why they look the way that they do? Modern computers and keyboards use the QWERTY layout, named for the letters in the top left-hand corner. This design isn't necessarily the most efficient, and if you think back to when you learned how to type, you probably recognize that it isn't the most intuitive either. The story of how the QWERTY keyboard came to be ties back to Morse code, marketing, and just a little bit of luck. Back in the 1860s, a man named Christopher Latham Scholes was busy developing ways to make offices more efficient. Notably, he spent time developing all different kinds of typewriters and key layouts to improve how people wrote and communicated. Working with others in the field, he patented the first typewriter in 1867. Previous to this invention, there were other machines used for writing, but none of them had become standard. Scholl's design resembled a piano interface where the letters were laid out alphabetically. Such a design may seem intuitive, but users had trouble finding the keys when they needed them. After working continuously to come up with the new designs, in 1863, Scholl landed on one that had a similar layout to the modern QWERTY keyboard, but a few keys were switched. It would have been known as the Q.T. and had a layout about like this. Popular legend suggests that Scholes landed on this design based on the need to reduce key jamming in early typewriters. It was thought that he laid out the keys in a way that allowed common letter sequences to be typed in rapid succession without a mechanical jam in the typewriter arms. However, researchers at Kyoto University suggested that this popular legend is all bunk in a 2011 paper. They argue, rather, that the QWERTY system emerged from testing with with telegraph operators. These operators suggested that the letters S, Z, and E be placed close together because the Morse codes for Z and SE were similar and often confused. This would allow the operator to prepare and type the appropriate letter just with the placement of a finger. This same methodology, the paper argues, was used to place various other letters across the keyboard. In 1878, Scholes finally landed on the QWERTY design by switching around some letters from his original Que.ty layout, noted by his patent filing. Currently, this theory with the influence from Morse code seems to be the closest to the truth of how the QWERTY design came to be, but historians still aren't exactly sure. Right after Scholes and his partner Carlos Glidden patented the QWERTY design and decided to start production, they entered a manufacturing agreement with the gunmaker Remington. This deal was a major success, and by 1890, 100,000 QWERTY keyboards were in use across the United States. The public began adopting the design not because it was necessarily the best or the most efficient, but because it was what was being made and sold. Remington was also one of the first companies to offer classes and certifications for typists, all on their keyboards. For companies across the United States, this meant that if you wanted a properly trained typist, you had to have Remington machines. Thus, the QWERTY key layout had to be in your office. This was clever marketing used to ensure brand loyalty and mass adoption of their machines. The fate of the QWERTY keyboard was finally cemented in history when, in 1893, Remington Smith Premier, Densmore, Yoast, and Calligraph, all major typewriter manufacturers at the time, merged together. When they did, they adopted the QWERTY as the standard. While the QWERTY keyboard design stuck, mostly because it was thought to be the best, or at least marketed in that way, when it was developed and marketed, its own designer didn't really believe in it. Scholes continued developing new typewriter designs for the rest of his life. The next biggest competitor to the QWERTY layout was something called the Dvorak Simplified Keyboard, developed in the 1930s by Dr. August Dvorak, and it looked like this. 
This design was argued to allow faster and more accurate typing because it arranged more common letters on the home row, allowing for less finger movement overall. However, recent research suggests that this wasn't actually the case, again surrounding the confusion about the origin of all these keyboards, but none of that really matters though, because you probably know that the Dvorak keyboard was never adopted. Even by the time of its invention, between world wars, it was too late for QWERTY to be overthrown. As keyboards moved from mechanical to digital in the 20th century, there wasn't necessarily a reason to keep the QWERTY layout. After all, there aren't any telegraph operators using typewriters, and we don't need to worry about jammed machines. However, much to the same reason why the US still uses the imperial system, people dislike change. So the QWERTY keyboard stuck around. Looking back through time, we've been left with the QWERTY keyboard layout because it was discovered at just the precise time to be produced for the mass market. After production, some clever marketing from Remington got the public and professionals locked into the design forever, and the rest is history.